Well, welcome. I'm Dr. Jeff Brown with the Merge Medical Podcast with my co-host, Dr. Jeff Cole. We're joined by Phil Sales of Sumate Technologies. Sumate Technologies is a revolutionary point of care scanning technology that automates inventory and payment management, thereby increasing efficiency and decreasing cost. Phil, did I say that all right? And welcome. Yes, that's correct. Uh, it's Sumate, but uh, we, we can uh, we can work with Sumate as well. It's, it's a hard <laughs> word to pronounce. Well, Phil, just uh, maybe to start off, why don't you tell us about the, the, the core product? I know we'll we'll circle back when we talk about uh, you know competitive advantages, your technology patents, but just a, a, more of a summary of your of your product to kick this thing off. You bet. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, gentlemen. Uh, I just a little background on me. I was a sales rep or a, a consultant, as they call them, for Synthes for 15 years uh, in the CMF division covering northern New England. So I had a pretty big patch. I had a pretty big territory. Um, I spent a lot of time in the operating room. And I spent a lot of time running around. As you can imagine, covering three states was uh, logistically uh, challenging. Um, and as a Synthes rep, you're intricately involved in all aspects of the supply chain, not only the case support, but counting the implants during surgery, relaying the information to the nurse to type into the EHR software quite often, and also managing downstairs, which is the restock and supply, reassembly of the sets and trays. And it dawned on me while I was working, uh, running around doing a lot of this supply chain work that there had to be a better way. And I did a little research uh, and found out uh, that there was a technology um, that is typically used in, in other areas, which is called point of care or point of use scanning. Think of a barcode. Think of when you go to the grocery store. And I, I wondered why it wasn't being used in the operating room. Very rarely you saw scanning occurring uh, to, to document things in the operating room. And I found out that surgical supplies or anything that's reprocessed does not lend itself well for optical scanning, which is, think of barcode. Um, going through the, the harsh reprocessing environment that surgical assets have to go through um, compromises the marks on the surgical items. Hmm. And the other thing that I found out was that a lot, and, and having dealt with CMF, a lot of little screws, you know, one and two and three millimeter screws, um, they're very irregular surfaces and they're difficult to put barcodes on. So uh, I found a technology out of New Jersey that was a, is microchip based and it's sort of half of an RFID chip. And one of the properties of the chip is it's extremely robust. And another property is it's very, very small. It's about the size of a piece of glitter and it's light powered. It doesn't read with an read optically. And I was able to, I left uh, J&J, I've always been a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I was working for J&J to Pew Synthes. I left there to develop this company. Um, and while I was in the process of developing the country company, we initially started with instruments, but uh, subsequently moved to the concept of scanning implant usage in the sterile field during surgery. The idea behind our technology is to take this microchip, which can survive reprocessing, and steal an idea that's used in retail. So everyone's gone to the grocery store and seen uh, the shelves of products with a little tag on the edge of the shelf. Um, that tag uh, corresponds with the item or product that's over it on the shelf in a row. Well, we basically take the chip and with our software, are able to map uh, orthopedic trays. So we put via uh, a series of little stainless steel tags and vinyl based uh, adhesive products, we can put the chip next to each SKU number or asset in the tray. So we can retrofit an existing orthopedic tray with these chips. And then we tell our software the unique number on each chip that's read with a laser scanner corresponds to that implant from that tray. We call the process set mapping. And what effectively it does is create dig orthopedic digital sets and trays, which bring enormous benefits with regard to inventory management and control for the device company, as well as quality patient record accuracy um, to the hospitals and providers. Yeah, that's fantastic. 
it's a lot to unpack. So you, you've got the, you've got the little piece of glitter. Um, what is that called? Uh, called a, it's called a pea chip. Um, and it's, it's, uh, the company is now in Chicago. Um, and basically these pea chips are, um, as I had mentioned, they're, they're powered by a laser scanner that can be sterilized. It can be cold sterilized. And so that laser scanner goes into the sterile field with a surgical technician. Hmm. And when the technician picks a screw or a plate based on the surgeon's request, the laser scanner can be used if you touch the little chip or the dot next to the implant or at the head of the row of screws, it records it was a five millimeter screw from uh, a, a particular tray. And the uh, information is recorded uh, on a screen. Now the screen has to be visible to the sterile field because you need the, the, uh, the, the feedback of the scan for the person that's doing the scanning. It'd be like using a keyboard without a, a monitor. So as the technician uses a screw, they touch the dot next to the implant and it records on the screen. It not only records what the implant was, but which tray it came out of. Um, that has a lot of operational value to the device companies for consigned assets. The other piece of the equation is we've licensed the technology from Symmetric uh, Healthcare Solutions out of Philadelphia that um, basically allows us to image the labels of sterile packaged products as they're used. And again, our tracker sits at the edge of the field, it's small footprint, it's only 18 by 18. And as the, if the nurse uses, or there's a request for a sterile product, a prepackaged sterile product, the nurse uh, images the label and the information, all the UDI information off the label is captured on the screen of the tracker, which is what we what we call the piece of equipment that has the screen at the edge of the field. And so we have the first system that that can document full UDI in one step, the sterile packaged implants and scan the usage of the non-sterile, which is the implants that are in the sets and trays in the sterile field. One of the problems with the non-sterile implants, the biggest problem is they're taken out of their packages they arrive at the hospital non-sterile in a package. They're removed from the package and put in a set and a tr or a tray. They lose all their UDI. They lose all their traceability at that point because they're, mm -hmm. they're unable to be marked. So we bring a measure of inventory control right to the patient and improve patient documentation and safety because when we image that label, we actually check for FDA recall or expiration date problems with that product. Um, which is a, a, a safety gain for uh, the patient as well. As, as transformational as this sounds, um, how about your licenses? Do you have exclusive licenses or uh, be something that would be nice to get locked up? <clears throat> Great question. So we've got um, a couple of moats, if you will, Dr. Cole. We have um, a, an exclusive license to the P-CHIP, which is for North America. Uh, we also have extensive IP surrounding the process of set mapping, which is creating digital sets and trays. We've been issued seven U.S. utility patents in that area. We have two more pending. So we have an extensive IP moat around the product. And I, I'd also mention that it uh, applied from supply chain function, patient record quality and patient safety, um, bringing this digital content to the sterile field is potentially uh, a very valuable, um, uh, it would be a valuable addition for the field personnel because we can bring med ed to the sterile field where it's actually used. So think about instructions on how to mix bone cement. Um, think about how to put together an X fix. All of this information can be digitally represented but it's usually locked up with a rep. The rep helps, which is very helpful. This is not going to get rid of sales reps. It sure. absolutely is not. It's gonna let a sales rep be more strategic in how they manage their territory so they can go to the cases where their expertise may be required, but alleviate them of the need to run around and do uh, what's otherwise supply chain function jobs that really don't advance mm -hmm. medicine or advance their territory, such as refilling sets and trays, right. 
going to standard cases, a, a, an ankle surgery, which the, everyone in the staff knows how to use the set. Um, they don't need to be there, but often they rely on the rep to be there and the rep has to be two places at once. This will ale allow a good rep to go much further. It sounds like it's as easy as a self-checkout at the grocery store. Is that accurate? 100% accurate. If you look at the benefits that point of sale scanning has, has, has brought the retail industry, it's staggering. And the advantages that this is going to provide the medical device and, and medical community are pretty much the same. It's a great analogy, Dr. Brown. Well, Jeff, Cole and I were talking about before you came online, like people don't understand, like sometimes stuff just gets missed. Like, oh, well, we're not going to bill for that screw. Do you have any numbers on how much does this improve the efficiency, like where you wouldn't miss items? Charge capture. Charge capture. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. F fantastic question. Um, so it's hard to measure a negative. That's mm. one of the challenges of that question. Um, we've uh, initiated uh, a study with four large academic medical centers here in New England um, and tried to answer that question. So the methodology that we used was we uh, went into the EHR software, which is the patient record software mm -hmm. or EMR software. Mm -hmm. And for a control group of implants that covered neuro, orthopedic and vascular surgery, we went in and measured or exported what was reported for that control group of implants for the medical center over a year, mm -hmm. which informs the billing. The EHR documentation informs the hospital billings uh, uh, ability. It basically goes exports right to billing. So this is effectively what the hospital got for reimbursement of those devices over the course of a year, that control group. We then went to the EHR for the same control group over the same period of time and exported what did the hospital issue for purchase orders for those implants. Right. And we came up with a delta of 12%. So there was a 12% difference in what the hospital paid for those implants mm -hmm. be, to what they billed for those implants. Now, there are uh, this, the study wasn't perfect, so we did not account for inventory fluctuation which could affect that number. But directionally, at every institution, we saw a loss of multiple millions of dollars. The number was $4 million in missed revenue opportunity for that hospital. There's right. absolutely no doubt as a rep. When I was a rep, I used to go to some of my hospitals where I couldn't be at the case, and there were things missing all the time from the tray. And I had to go back through the, they call right. them the green sheets, and look for the implants that could be associated with that case. Couldn't find them. Right. Yeah. And when that data is put into the EHR, it's, it's basically dead data. A lot of times, I mean, it's, it's kind of locked there. It's, it's a black hole. That's a, it's a great point, Dr. Cole. Um, the EHR software is governed by HIPAA regulations, uh, patient privacy, mm -hmm. uh, very strict regulations around that software. It's, it's siloed. And once it goes in there, it's pretty much a black hole. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of contacts in, in supply chain that try to get data out of that. And each one is a special uh, report that has to be initiated and executed and run. And it's very difficult. So liquid data uh, for what's used in surgery is pretty much eliminated by going into that software. Once it goes into the EHR, remember, it's manually keyed into that EHR. So there's a lot of errors associated with manually keying. Um, one in 300 keystrokes statistically is an error. Um, but the other point is that we're capturing all of the UDI information for the package products with one step. And that, that has enormous implications for downstream for advancing medicine, starting to, by capturing the data at the front end and ma making it available in a liquid format, we collect all non-PHI data. That data can be used for research. It can be used for studying outcomes. Downstream, there are enormous implications for medicine for, uh, that are afforded by digital automation documentation on the front end. I would think, although not intended, uh, technology a lot of times will add work to people's, uh, to their job. But I, I can't imagine there's a single person involved in the, in, in the delivery of care that would not benefit through the efficiency and the time of this. Because otherwise it's just a manual process. They're, they've got these packages and they're 
saving them. And at the end of the case, they're writing down numbers. And and usually there's two there's because the EHR often doesn't talk with the ERP, which is the, the enterprise management software. There's two sets of keystroke entries. It's keyed again down in purchasing mm -hmm. uh, the patient record that our biggest challenge, without a doubt, is change management in the hospital environment. So this is a new piece of equipment. It's a new workflow. It certainly benefits almost everyone, but it is change. And uh, affecting change management across a technology that has uh, impacts multiple uh, areas of the hospital is complex and difficult because uh, the tracker and our scanning technology is affects the OR, it affects supply chain, it affects finance, it has to be integrated, it affects IT. So that's actually, you brought up a point, uh, Dr. Cole, our biggest challenge is the change management aspect in the hospital environment. For that reason, we're looking at going to the ambulatory surgery center market first. Yeah. It has a lot of, um, uh, there are a lot of differences in the ASC market, which lead us to believe that adoption will occur there first, uh, and then secondarily in the hospital provider market. Does yeah, I was just thinking that. I, I would agree 100%. I feel like physicians have more of a connection at the, at the ASCs. They're more involved in management and, and the, the entire work product. And uh, I think it's much, uh, it's, a, it's a less tall mountain to climb there. It is. It's, it's generally, if, the sur if it's, especially if it's surgeon owned. So if the, the surgeon right. owners decide they want to do it, it's done. It's going to get done. It gets done. It yeah. gets done. Does it interface with all the major uh, EMRs? So we have a number of software partnerships we're developing. So the long answer is yes, Dr. Brown. Uh, the short answer right now uh, is that we have um, uh, a minimum level of integration with a couple of uh, integrator software companies. Um, we roll the product out in two stages generally. Uh, the first is... Well, I should back that up. We roll the product out for the hospital market, which we're not really addressing right now. We are. We've got a study with the NIH and digital health folks uh, where uh, we're going to be going to three large medical centers for a, an actual paid rollout. The government grant is going to pay for our integration and rollout. But for the ambulatory surgery center market, we are working through small to mid-sized device companies. So the dynamic in an ASC is much different, as we know, in a hospital. The ASC typically does a much more focused group of surgeries, um, and they have a more focused, because of that, they have a more focused consignment of digital, of, of orthopedic trays to the account. So for instance, if you go to a foot and ankle, they'll typically have one vendor that they use mm -hmm. for almost, you know, most of their surgeries, for 80% of their surgeries. And that vendor is, is more likely to be a, what we call a value device vendor, which is a small to mid-sized company that offers a better price for a, a, a similar or as just as good product. Those companies, because their value associated, are our best partner. And by partnering with them, we can create digital trays for them. Our first partner was uh, One Surgical mm -hmm. out of Memphis, Tennessee, uh, who yeah. make a broad array of, of implants. Um, and we've developed digital trays for them. We're working in conjunction with them to roll this out at some of their uh, larger ambulatory surgery center customers. So a partnership into the ambulatory surgery center, we can go in with the, the, uh, the device company and literally roll the trays in with the tracker. They're ready to go. They're already digital and mapped. So it's, it's almost like a swap out, right? We just roll it in and on Monday we go. Um, there's an element of training for the staff. The surgical technician has to be uh, comfortable with the scanning. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, though, there's minimal change management, and it's a clean swap out and rollout process for those ambulatory surgery centers for their for their orthopedic uh, devices that would be their main vendor. And how often, how how reusable are these chips? I'm calling them chips. I don't know if that's the proper term, but there's pieces of glitter. <laughs> these tiny chips that you're using to map the, 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 the devices. How yes. reusable and autoclavable is that? We've tested them out to 400 cycles. Oh, wow. So uh, typically that will be two years. Mm -hmm. um, wow. Now, will there be an occasional failure? I, I would assume yes. Nothing is 100%. Mm -hmm. But we had a 99% success rate out over 400 cycles 
with we, we call the uh, the marking technology tag marks for the trays. And mm-hmm. they come in a variety of formats, 2.4, 3.5. Those are screws you commonly associate in, in orthopedic trays. Mm-hmm. Again, we have a, a vinyl based adhesive that uses the surgical tape you use to mark instruments. Um, it's a little dot which can be put on the tray. But we anticipate uh, the tray should last two to three years and probably need maintenance in two or three years. Be uh, the tag marks removed, new ones put in, and the tray be remapped. One of the nice uh, features of set mapping is the inventory control aspect of it. So the tray always knows what's in it. Mm-hmm. So uh, when you want to do audit, inventory audits are a giant uh, problem for the device companies. Once or twice a year, they have to audit what's out in the field mm-hmm. and they have to open the trays up manually count everything with digital trays that can be done in keystrokes wow I mean, the amount of of labor reduction for the yeah. device companies is that's staggering. huge it's staggering. huge yeah it really is wow every once in a while a, a screw set will get turned over and screws go everywhere <laughs> uh, what kind of a problem does that create well if it so the way the trays are are um set up is there's usually a lid over the tray that holds the implants in and trays can get dumped. I've spent a lot of time crawling around on the floor, uh, a couple of my accounts during surgery, uh, either looking for a, uh, a screw or looking for a plate, a whole tray is, is a real catastrophe. Um, the tray would have to be remapped at that point. Um, so if the, if the tags come out, if the posts come out of the hole, the screw hole that they're in, Mm -hmm. um, and they aren't, pressed in they're, they're sort of they sit there just like a screw does in the tray mm-hmm. um, that tray would need to be remapped so it it's not a disaster as far as the overall uh um uh ability of the tray to be digital but there is a labor step there with remapping the tray to make sure that it's it's good to go and it's a mess otherwise it's a disaster <laughs> <laughs> what about competition do you do you know of anyone else doing something similar um so Here's the, here's the dynamic. It's a very interesting question. So the first thing that we looked at was marking the implants with the chip. And no one wants an implant with a chip on it. That's, that's a huge, uh, it's, it's not only a challenge, but there's, a, there's sort of an ethical question. Do people want things with chips being put into exactly. their bodies, right? Mm-hmm. And that's, that's probably a 10-year study to make sure the tray doesn't leach or it needs to be proved safe and effective. So, so putting... Putting a chip on an implant is probably not, not a viable way to go right now. Um, we know that marks, based on our previous conversation, that optical marks don't really work that well on the, on the implants. The, the other problem is with marking the implants themselves, if, if there was a way to do it, is you've got tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of implants that are out there right now that have no marks. So how do you do this? How do you control the rollout when you've got so much inventory in the field with no marks? Um, it would be difficult, and I don't think it would it would be tolerated in surgery to have the scrub tech looking at each, trying to find the the mark on the screw if there was one or not. You've got to have a complete system. So um, marking the trays is. The tray is the primary operational asset that the device company uses to measure uh, uh, operational efficiency and ROI of their inventory. So marking the trays and and being able to um, uh, inventory the trays and keystrokes, that's the way to go. The the only technology that we've really seen, so if you're going to mark the tray next to the implant, our patents cover, if you put a barcode there, it's a machine readable mark next to the to the asset in the tray. So whether it's a chip or a barcode, our IP covers that. Um, the only other way would be what's called intelligent vision. Um, and that involves uh, intelligent cameras that uh, basically look at the uh, tray and can tell what's inside the tray based on the camera looking at the tray. Think uh, Amazon has tried it in retail, right? Having a registerless mm-hmm. retail environment. They did it in some of the cities where mm-hmm. they had cameras all around the store. And they, if you pick something off the shelf, it, it would know that yeah. it was you and you, you would just purchase it. You put it back on it. It, it uh, uh, basically removes the purchase. So intelligent vision 
is is a potential downstream avenue for that would be a competitive technology. The challenge with the that technology is often um, the trays have stacked implants in them, and it's difficult if 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 unless the camera is right over. But even if it's right over. If you have multiple implants stacked, like on a CMF facial tray, if you have, or a neuro tray, if you have like four or five implants in a well, it's very difficult for that, the red, to get the registration to be able to read if there were three or there are four plates in that well. It's extremely mm -hmm. challenging. So I would think maybe, you know, with the way technology develops in 20 or 30 years, we may add that to the tracker, some sort of intelligent vision. But right now, the clearest path that we have to solve this problem over the next 10, 12, 15 years is scanning at point of use, which is an industry standard in, 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 mm -hmm. in any supply chain document, documentation system. Yeah, I can't imagine Walmart being Walmart without using right. technology like this. I mean, Interesting doing, parable. So barcodes were, were around since the 1950s. The mm -hmm. scanning technology was largely developed in the 60s, but it didn't really get widely used till the 80s. And what was the problem? The problem was that the, the retail uh, stores, they had a difficult time. IBM had developed the readers. They had a difficult time getting the stores to invest in the reading technology at the register. It was expensive. Um, the first company to do this was Walmart. Um, and the interesting piece of that story is that Kmart and Walmart did it both at the same time. Kmart only viewed it as a way to move customers through the line more quickly at the checkout. Walmart uh, capitalized and realized that the data was the real gold. Sure, the customer experience is improved by speeding up the register, but they were able to use the data and leverage that data to create incredible supply chain efficiencies, mm -hmm. which they rode to absolute dominance in the retail industry and basically drove Kmart into the ground. Um, they got a head start they never relinquished. So once this technology gets adopted, there is extreme pressure for the other competitors, so the competing ASEs, competing hospital systems, to adopt it. It goes quickly because they have to adopt it because we know that the data is a, worth a fortune, Not again, not only to the hospitals, but to the device companies. You're at a competitive disadvantage if you're not scanning at point of use. What kind of market penetration do you have currently? Well, we're a startup company. So we're an angel seed funding round right now. We've raised over a million and a half dollars. We made it through COVID. COVID was very difficult for us. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we were able to survive, which is basically uh, scraping and clawing. Um, we invested in our patent technology. We continue to develop the technology. We have patient investors. Um, we've done a pilot at University of Vermont under the direction of Dr. Bartlett. Uh, who's the head of trauma up there? Um, mm -hmm. Successful. We did eight. We marked uh, and tagged the Synthes tray, and we did eight ankle fractures with uh, Dr. Bartlett's small frag tray. Um, had 100% implant documentation accuracy. So uh, proof of concept was done. Then uh, we have a study that's been. We're waiting to hear on it from the NIH. It's a million dollar grant to go to uh, Duke Geisinger and University of Nebraska to do SimLab studies to develop data and then actual rollouts of the technology. And through our partner, One Surgical, right now, we have three uh, ASCs across the country that are forward-thinking ASCs that are looking to bring us in to, roll, to do pilots. So we don't have a commercial account right now. I would say we're in pilot. We've, we've validated the technology. Um, what we're doing now is we're, we're basically doing pilots, which will lead to customers, we hope, in 2024. We're going after the ASC market first, though, to, to my conversation. Yeah, I like that. What can you say? I'm trying to understand what One Surgical is doing with, I guess, trays that are custom made from the start to, to, to utilize this technology. And then how does that compare with <clears throat> existing, say, Synthes trays and how you retrofit those? And what's, uh, what's the future? So um, we look, we, we're going to operate on the 80-20 rule, which exists in almost every industry, which is 20% of something covers 80% of something else. So if you look at, um, for instance, orthopedic sales, 20% of the reps do 70 to 80% of the business um, because they're the best reps. The same thing exists uh, with surgical sets and trays. So what we'll do is we'll focus on the high volume trays 
that get used used the most. S specialty trades or complex cases probably are not the best target for digital trades to begin with because you're going to want that rep there to support the case, to make sure that everything is done properly, especially if there are multiple sets and trays. Um, but routine cases, something that a small frag would cover, uh, such as an ankle or a wrist fracture uh, in trauma, will be uh, ideal candidates because they get used the most and the rep doesn't necessarily have to be there if there's a high degree of familiarity. So what we do with our device partners is we target their high volume trays we can retrofit them either with the adhesive chip, depending on the, the way the tray is designed, or we have a partner in Colorado who can retrofit the trays, basically put a hole in the tray, which doesn't interrupt the, steril steril the sterilization factor in the tray and just drop the pin in next to the asset. We can make the, tray, the implant uh, pegs or the microchip pegs, P-chip pegs or tag marks down to 1.5 millimeters in diameter. So we can pretty much uh, drill out and put our technology into any tray. The idea is that we'll select the high volumes that we can roll in to cover the routine cases and deliver the value both to the vendor and to the provider. When, when it comes to working with those device companies, um, I think you, you mentioned some of the smaller companies, perhaps better partners at this, at this phase. Um, yeah, the smaller companies are uh, able to make decisions faster. Um, there's less layers of bureaucracy to go through. You know you're dealing with the right people. So I can't say who. I can say one surgical because we have a public relationship with them. We've got a couple of others that are, are interested and we're working through the, the decision process to develop digital trays currently. At the end of the day, uh, there, the, 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 in the orthopedic device industry, there will be device companies that are more readily uh, looking to disrupt, and there will be companies that have uh, less uh, ability to do that. But I, I think they will. I just think we have to find the thought leaders and the people that are looking to disrupt, maybe gain market share. Um, and some of it depends on their relationship with their distributors and the complexity of the sets and trays that I make. they make. If it's a really complex uh, tray, and it's a complex surgery, they're gonna be less likely than a company that makes a, a more routine case, such as an ankle or a wrist fracture. That's really our sweet spot, are the high volume, uh, high dollar volume as well, as far as overall, because of the number of cases, uh, in, in the case of like trauma, possibly foot and ankle bunion surgery is a very common surgery. That's a ripe market, that's a that's a potential lucrative market for us to introduce digital trays. The, the other, the other point is that there's a big sort of dichotomy of opinion in the industry to the concept of a rep-less model. It's been tried for the last 15, 20 years. Uh, it's been attempted unsuccessfully, I might say. There's a very uh, famous study out of La Jolla, California, where a hospital tried to go repless, and they weren't able to do it. I think the important point to emphasize here is this uh, digital trays do not make a repless environment. You're always going to need good reps. Mm -hmm. The question is, can we make those reps? The, the orthopedic device industry has the highest cost of sales of any industry in the world. It's 35% is what their cost of sales support is on their overall revenue. Other industries are typically 15 to 20%. And the reason for that is, is that they have these reps involved in every step of the supply chain. And what digital trays enable is greater efficiency and allows, we, we like to say we don't enable rep less, we enable less rep. But what that means is a rep can cover five or six accounts now instead of two. Mm -hmm. uh, it possibly, I mean, depending on how things are sliced and diced, it could be a revenue boon for a very top level rep to develop digital accounts because that allows them to go out and develop new accounts. Um, they're not tied to the existing account. I would have loved digital trays if I had my old territory where I had three states because I would know that my the routine cases were being covered effectively. I would get the data when I wasn't there. I would get the mm -hmm. data on what was being used. The, the, the reporting is real time off the software. So everyone knows real time what's being used. Um, and I could manage my territory much more effectively 
digital accounts are just a strategic tool for the orthopedic industry to run more efficiently. Yeah. And how, um, how do you envision like a nationwide rollout of what you've got? Are you going to have a sales force or how does that work? You think? So uh, it's a great question. Um, we have a five-year plan. We've got a CFO. We've planned everything out. We, we init- we basically envision uh, the developing the ASC market, which we see is right now it's about a hundred million dollars. Um, and that's just purely for the vet, the, what we charge for the service. So we actually charge the device company Mm -hmm. to replace the system right now. That's the way our business model. It's a software as a service. Mm -hmm. We charge per tracker per month. Um, we've done some cost analysis to have a rep cover the case or cover the account is, uh, one cost. If you have digital trays and and they're scanning and the rep doesn't have to be there, we, we see about a 40 to 50% reduction improvement on margin at that account, not having to have a rep there. So we, we think that's enough. And with the data we provide and quite honestly, one surgical agrees with what we've put on the table that the, the margin increase pays for and delivers ROI in the system for them. So they're willing to at least subsidize the system to the account. Um, the other interesting concept that we, we've been looking at, and it's a little controversial, but the medical industry as a whole, but in particular the orthopedic device industry, does not effectively monetize their data. So uh, if you think about it, uh, a big ASC does a million dollars a year with a device company. Um, that, that usage data for what the surgeons are using for which procedures has value. Um, we're thinking that potentially a potential revenue stream for the company, and we, we've got to work more closely with the surgeons on this, it's nascent, we're just working on it now, is that if you could monetize the usage data from that ASE, from the surgeon on ASE, that this could actually be a a revenue provider for the ASCs, but they'd have to relinquish their data. So they would have to, you know, what they're using implants on and what the types of cases are. No, no patient information, just Mm -hmm. information about what the surgeon is doing. Um, It's got value to their vendor because they, they can replenish things more quickly. Um, So, so we think that that's going to be a revenue stream. And then the macro, the metadata is going to be worth a fortune at some point. It's a long-winded answer to your question, Dr. Brown. Um, but we see a, a direct sales force working with the device companies initially. There's a high, there's a technical element of this, of introducing it to an OR. I've got a bunch of ex-Synthes guys who want to come work for us. Um, but, but introducing this into an operative environment, you're going to need someone who's familiar with that environment, who understands the personalities, how mm-hmm. things work in an OR, what they can and can't do. There's a level of technical aspect to that. However, um, at the end of the day, we see ourselves as an acquisition target for three, di- three distinct areas. One would be uh, companies that are intricately involved in supply chain function of the hospital industry, a company like Cardinal Health, Texas, that Owens and Minor, that manage supply chain function for hospitals. Um, that's one, one avenue. Another avenue p- potentially is the actual EHR software companies that do the analytics as well. So um, you're looking at Epic or Cerner that want to get into more analytics to provide value to the customers. They could potentially acquire this. And the other is the device industry itself. Um, I think this is better not siloed with one company, this technology, but... Uh, if the IP is strong enough, um, you know, we potentially, they pay giant multiples. If this technology starts to get adopted, you could have a striker or a Synthes come in mm-hmm. and pay a very high multiple for the IP of this company uh, to develop their own digital trays and effectively gain competitive advantage through that. Um, I think it's at the end of the day, it potentially could be licensing. That way it goes to everyone. Um, and it just basically can be used where it's most effective and sold by a number of companies. Can we talk a little bit about the, uh, the financial aspect of this? Like I've got several questions about, you know, what do you think your total adjustable market is? What do you think the company's worth? You've done a fundraising round, raised a million dollars. I'm assuming the grants that you received are non-dilutive. Correct. What, what's the post money valuation of the round you're in now? 
So we're in an angel round right now. Uh, we're valuing the company at $5.5 million, uh, which is a very, very attractive valuation. Um, we're, we're getting into a complex market, uh, but um, we're very efficient. We have a very slow, small burn. We're only burning $14,000 a month. Um, we're in an angel round. We've had 250 committed so far on that angel round of 750. Um, with the additional 500, we get to customers. I have absolutely 100% confidence. Most of the technical risk has been taken out of the product. We've designed, we've used everything in surgery. Um, the 500 is basically, which, which completes the angel round, 250 will be to finish writing or handing off the software. So we have a cloud software application, which has been written. It's a little old now because it was written over the last two or three years. It needs to be updated and offloaded to a scalable entity. So we're, we're in the, we just did the business process of transferring the knowledge base on the software from our CTO to a company that we're going to work with that's going to build a, a commercially scalable cloud software application that with a mind towards meeting the, the, the safety and, and um, healthcare HIPAA stringent requirements that the software is going to need to meet, as well as uh, multi-tenancy. So it can be used uh, over lots of different customers, scalable. That's going to cost us around 250 grand. Um, and then the second 250 goes to building trackers and starting to go to trade shows. I, I'm just so eager to get to the AORN. I'm so eager to get to a trade show. Yeah. Because I think people are going to follow. I think their jaw's going to drop when they see what we're doing. Um, yeah. If you look at every other industry, it operates this way. This is a, this is a, orthopedics is a very interesting industry. Um, I think history shows we're right. Um, I think it's going to go to digital management. Everything else has. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it'll be exactly how we envision it. But again, the, the, the important thing to remember is at the end of the day, we're a data company. We're, we're not a scanning company. The data that this is going to generate is absolutely fabulous uh, from, a, from the standpoint of advancing medicine, but it also has a tremendous amount of value in, in probably the biggest industry in this country, which is healthcare. That's fantastic. Yeah, that is fantastic. Phil, if I'm understanding the process properly, you've got a technology that improves patient care, um, increases uh, the efficiency, um, and decreases the cost. And uh, is that accurate? So there, there are three things it does. Um, the, the first thing it does is it um, improves the finances. Mm -hmm. of, of, and it improves finances through operational efficiency. So finance is one, mm -hmm. operational efficiency and also charge capture. Mm -hmm. So you got one that's bottom line, operational efficiency through better management of inventory. I, we're, when we do our sim labs, just as an aside with the study, we're going to see how long if it can shave time off cases, right? Mm -hmm. So we can publish that. That'll be part of the publication. It'll save 10 minutes a case, not having the nurse have to type everything and having her do the counts or him do the counts and getting the room ready for turnover. That's really important to ASCs. Um, 10 minutes, a case is really important to an ASC. It's not that important to a hospital mm -hmm. yet. Um, so basically you've got the finance aspect for bottom line through uh, operational efficiency, top, top line through charge capture, gaining more, more complete charge capture. The other is quality, patient records. You, I can't tell you how many times I would have a surgeon call me when I was back working for Synthes and then have me into their office to look at radiographs. And they'd say to me, do you know what this is? What kind of screw this is? We need mm -hmm. to take it out. Mm -hmm. um, that's really, that's not acceptable. That really shouldn't happen. Um, scanning at point of views will eliminate that. So right. I think there's, there's certainly a patient record quality matri um, um, that this uh, addresses. And then the, the last one is patient safety. Um, if we're able to, scan packaged items and capture the full UDI, which is serial number, lot number in one step, right. and have that into the patient record. If there are recalls, we prevent recalled items from being used. If there are post-operative recalls, we have all the data. That's, we can notify yeah. patients of a recall. Yeah. Um, so That's it's really familiar. good. It, it's sort of like the trifecta. It's financial, it's operational, it's patient safety and quality. It addresses all three. Yeah, and that's really what we're looking for here I mean, it, it checks all the boxes, you know, it's going to make patients better, make doctor's jobs easier 
and make the bottom line better. I mean, it checks all the boxes. It really and, does. And we, what we need, guys, right now, we need surgeon advocates. Yeah. So we we need the met, the surgeon community to get behind us because without without their support, um, an acting change is much more difficult. Getting the mm -hmm. surgeons is really important to me. So I I really appreciate this. Any effort that I because at the end of the day, what we're doing is advance advances medicine. The technology I, I see it being perfect for orthopedic uh, device use in the trays, but there's got to be other industries that like I haven't thought of, but it's got to be able to be used elsewhere. It's so good. Oh, the, the, the P chip. Yeah. The, the P chip. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. That chip only guys, the chip is a penny to make. It's incredibly that cheap. Is great. To make it. So, so the P chip corp out of Chicago has, they're looking at um, uh, gray market and black market applications for, uh, high value brands like Parmesan cheese. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal. I can send you the article. Um, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal like two weeks ago about P Chip Corp and how they're helping um, companies um, eliminate gray market for their products or counterfeits. Um, so it has an application in, in, in that market. It has an application in aeronautics. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about things like jet engines that have incredible, it's, it's a little bit like orthopedics, right? Lots of incredibly high tolerance. Right. Uh, valuable parts that need to be traced and tracked right. throughout the supply chain. Um, the chip is so small and so durable, it can be put on an engine. Um, it, 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 it will survive up to 600 degrees of, of temperature. So <laughs> um, it, it can be used in that. It's a great point, Dr. Brown. It can be used in applications across many industries. This is just one. We saw it initially for orthopedic uh, re surgical reprocessed items. Um, I think the chip is going to find its way somehow onto instruments at point of manufacture. So uh, instruments can be scanned. Um, I, I just think it has lots of applications. You're hundred percent right. Phil, can we circle back to the physician advocate uh, comment you made? Because I feel like watching everything that happened in digital health and you had these companies raise hundreds of millions of dollars with no physician on the advisory board, no physician involved and now watching some of them crash because they they, they, they thought oh we've got to go sell this <laughs> instead of just one ceo you know taking another ceo to dinner and um so i, I think the physician adoption and i think that's huge it, are there any issues with physician investors in this company because I, I feel like there's multiple levels between that investment and point of care I don't. There is. Um, it's again, fast, fabulous question. Um, so we've we've been to legal counsel and discussed this, and the opinion as it stands now is the system is does not touch reimbursement from CMS or insurance. Has nothing to do with that. Uh, in as much as um, using the system is is not a directly reimbursable. Uh, from, from insurance, from the payers. So uh, the, the legal opinion that we got from one of the big big, uh, big law firms was that right now we're, we're perfectly fine for surgeon investment. That's good news. Because I feel like you, you potentially could find a, a, a surgeon-owned ASC that might want to take a piece of that, That's what I'm looking for. So, so I'd like to ask you um, probably a long answer, but how do you write a grant? <laughs> I mean, that's a big, it's a big project. It was project. way bigger than I thought. So I have right. no experience doing it. Um, and that's why I'm asking, like, how did you do that? So we, we have a number of people surrounding some, and I think he'll do an interview. Um, I think maybe an, and again, you might want to interview him too, because he's fascinating is our, uh, one of our, our strategic advisor. If you go to our website, is Jimmy, Dr. Cheng, Jimmy Cheng. Mm -hmm. Jimmy wrote the UDI regulations, or he was his hands were all over. He works for Duke. He's he's a cardiology interventional cardiologist, mm -hmm. but he's also a professor of informatics. Mm. And his passion was is medicine at a heart a large scale. But Jimmy is is a he's a great guy. You guys would love him. He's he's a first name guy. He said, please call me Jimmy. Um, very very incredibly smart. But his passion now is, is data. It's not, he, of course, it's medicine. He still practices. Mm -hmm. But about 60% of his time is now spent around informatics, medical informatic, uh, informatics and data. Um, 
he helped us write the grant. He's written a bunch of grants mm -hmm. as an academic. Mm -hmm. And we also have one of my board members who was, was the CEO of P-Chip Corp, uh, has P-Chip for, for a number of years completely subsisted on technology Department of Defense grants to, to develop that chip. Mm -hmm. um, so he's written 20, 25 grants. Guys, I, I had no idea how hard and how much work. We, we had a team that it took us a year to write mm -hmm. that grant. Mm -hmm. It was a lot. I, I couldn't believe it. Um, and we also found a, a willing and, and um, uh, uh, exuberant primary investigator who is a professor of supply chain studies out at um, uh, Weber State in Utah. So we sort of were able, I was, well, I'm really not, I'll be honest with you. I'm not, not a genius type guy. I'm a sales guy. Um, however, I'm pretty good at bringing people together. That's one of my, I'm, I'm pretty good at that. I'm pretty good at finding the right people. So the short answer is I found all the right people to help me, Dr. Brown. Mm. Um, and that I'm, I'm so grateful to them because I'm very lucky that I found these people and these people are committed. Um, you know, they've effectively done all this work for nothing to some extent, because we don't have a lot of money. Um, they're in it because they care about what we're doing and they see the long-term value. Love it. It's one of the things that, that, at Merge Medical, we talk about a lot because physicians, we, you know, we give so much away, you know, these, these scientific journals, they, they, they make money off the articles. We provide them for free. We, we, we're altruistic. We, we, we want the best for patients and yet we're surrounded by big business, you know, whether it's uh, the HR companies, the insurers, the big health systems. So much money is made off of your, your and, sweat and toil. It's, yeah, it's staggering. It's staggering. I just feel like you've got, you've got a, a patient and a, a physician or healthcare provider and above, right above that, you've, you've got dozens of these entities swirling around, figuring out how to make money off of us. And, by damn it, it's time for physicians to, to organize and uh, make money together, you know? And, well, that, that could be part of the story, right? If you're, if this data is at the ambulatory surgery center and you own the ambulatory surgery center, it's yours. Yeah. Yeah. And, and quit apologizing for it. Right. Because, mm -hmm. you know, all these other entities have driven the providers into a really precarious place where, you know, it's in, in orth and I'm I'm blessed because in orthopedics, you know, we're we're not burned out as a lot of people are in other subspecialties. But um, you know, it's it's tough out there for for a lot of people. So, you know, we we feel like, um, you know, to support the, the physician patient relationship, uh, physicians need to stand on better financial footing, so that we can say no to to bad contracts, say no to to predatorial buyout offers to you know to all the things that are out there right now so anyway i, I really appreciate uh you being here and, and learning from you and uh, look forward to see where where you go and hopefully we'll we'll, we'll tag some physician investors on onto the caboose yeah we, we'd, i'd love to collaborate with you guys moving forward so you know if our story can can resonate with the merge medical community so be it i, I i'm i really appreciate your time thank you